Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. And my name is Christy Tanner. I'm a PhD student from the University of Valencia, and I'm here for three months in Harvard to do a stay for my PhD, thanks to a fellowship from the Real Colegio Complutense. So today in this webinar, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I'm doing for my PhD thesis, and more specifically, what I'm doing here in Boston during my three-month stay. So, as you can see by the title, um, in my PhD thesis, we're interested in studying microorganisms that are able to produce pigments and that live on solar panels. So specifically, uh, we have been interested in the last few years in carotenoids. So carotenoids are natural pigments that are responsible for the color that we see in many fruit and vegetables. And they're very important, not only for plant health, but also for human health. So for example, uh, these two carotenoids, uh, lutein and zeaxanthin, are very important for human health in the sense that um, they are found in the macula lutea in the eye and they act as a filter for blue light, protecting this way the, re the retina against this high energy wavelength. So if a human individual is deficient in these carotenoids, this could lead to macular de degeneration and finally this could also lead to blindness. Some other interesting and very well-known carotenoids are alpha and beta carotene. These are also known as provitamin A because these molecules are transformed in the human body into the vitamin A. This vitamin is very important for growth, development, immune response, and again, for uh, health in eyesight. So in this particular case, uh, deficiencies in vitamin A is one of the leading causes of blindness in children, especially in developing countries. Another very interesting carotenoid is lycopene. Uh, this carotenoid is what gives the typical red color to tomatoes and red peppers that we can see. And what's specifically interesting about lycopene is that it's a very antioxidant molecule. So, uh, this is a term that many people have heard, I think, antioxidants, but I just want to explain a little bit what they actually do in the human body. So, to explain the concept of antioxidant, it's important to know the concept of free radical. So, free radicals are reactive molecules that can form in the human body, in the cells, either due to natural causes, like the human metabolism, or to external causes, like, for example, smoke from cigarettes. And these free radicals, as I said, are very reactive and they can contribute to a series of diseases, including inflammatory diseases, ischemic diseases, neurological disorders, or even carcinogenesis. So what carotenoids do as antioxidants is that they neutralize uh, some of these free radicals. So as I was saying, carotenoids are very important for human health because of all these uh, properties they have. They're antioxidant, they protect eyesight, um, they're pro-vitamin A, but they're also very valuable in, f in the food industry. So specifically, uh, carotenoids are used as colorants in food and beverage production. And something that I found very interesting and I did not know about is that they are used as feed additives for uh, farming industries that grow fish such as salmon or trout. So many times the very intense pink color that you can see in salmon is due to the fact that these fish have been fed with carotenoids. Um, and they're also interesting at, in the cosmetic industry because they are used as dietary nutri cosmetics or even for skin application, like topical applications. So all these carotenoids, uh, whether they're used as dietary supplements or as colorants, they're usually produced either through chemical synthesis or natural extractions. So the thing with chemical synthesis is that aside from the negative connotation that the, the term chemical synthesis has, especially um, now that um, organic and natural products are so popular, also many carotenoids have not been able to, they have a series of problems and is that they're less cost efficient and the yield that you can obtain from them is lower than chemical synthesis. So. In uh, our research, we were interested in isolating and finding new microorganisms, specifically bacteria, 
that would be able to produce carotenoids and we're interested in seeing how we can extract these carotenoids and use them for all of these this wide range of applications that I've been talking about. So in previous projects, uh, carotenoid producing microorganisms have been typically isolated from highly irradiated environments such as soil surfaces or surface waters. And this is because carotenoids play a very important role in protecting the microorganisms against irradiation. So for our studies, we also chose a highly irradiated, irradiated environment, which are solar panels. So these glass smooth surfaces are interesting because they're exposed to the maximum amount of irradiation that you can get and uh, also, they have other extreme conditions um, that are affecting them, such as desiccation or high amount of temperature fluctuations. So we chose these solar panels as a source of bacteria that we could work with. The first publication about the solar panel microbiome was a couple of years ago, just before I joined the lab. And in this uh, publication, um, they described the microbiome that inhabits the solar panels. So I'm just going to give you a few highlights on the results of this research. So despite the harsh conditions, which make it hard to imagine that solar panels could actually harbor a, a very diverse microbiome, what they saw was that, in fact, there was a very uh, high amount of bacteria and yeast living on these solar panels and that there was a very large diversity. Also, um, these, although these solar panels are found in an urban environment, um, the microorganisms that were found inhabiting these solar panels were in fact uh, bacteria that are typically found in desertic regions. So it's not the typical bacteria you could find as human-associated or animal-associated bacteria or even typical from urban environments. They were typically found in hot or cold deserts. And when these samples from the solar panels were grown on bacterial growth medium, what you could see is that a large amount of these colonies were actually pigmented, which led to think that they were producing um, carotenoids because, as you can see, uh, the pigments range from yellow to red, even orange, and this is typically the colors that carotenoids would give. The question that we, we were asking ourselves after this study is, because these solar panels were actually sampled in Valencia, so we were wondering whether other solar panels from other locations would also carry such a specific uh, irradiation-adapted community. So for this, we sampled solar panels from the North and the South Pole, um, and the question we wanted to answer was, are these uh, microbiomes in fact similar to the ones in Valencia or do they depend on the location, the ge geographical location? And this was actually published a few months ago and what we saw is that, as you can see in the title, uh, both, not only both locations, meaning the North and South Pole, but also Valencia, the three locations, displayed very similar taxonomical composition of the microbial community. In both of these studies uh, that we did previously, we saw that um, when we grew the bacteria, there was many pigmented colonies. But also, when we analyzed uh, through sequencing the bacterial community, we saw that there was a large amount of uh, bacteria that belonged to that community and that had been described to produce carotenoids. So all that, together with the fact that carotenoids play uh, an important role in protecting against radiation, led us to think that these microorganisms could be good sources of carotenoids. So this leads to the next uh, paper that we're working on at the moment um, in which we have specifically tested the isolates from the solar panels to see uh, if they have a very high antioxidant activity, which would be expected if they contain um, natural combinations of carotenoids, and also to see which types of carotenoids they actually contain. So, as I say, this is a work that we're still currently developing and we're hoping to publish soon, but I just want to give you a few, um, a brief uh, summary of the results that we've obtained. So, what we did in this uh, project is we used the model organism C. elegans to test the antioxidant properties of the bacteria. 
So this is interesting for two reasons. Um, C. elegans um, is, as I said, it's a very small worm that actually feeds off bacteria. So these experiments were as simple as giving the worm our pigmented bacteria as food and comparing it with worms that were being fed with a normal diet without these pigments. And what we saw is that the worms that were fed with our pigmented bacteria displayed a very high survival rate when they were subjected to oxidative stress in comparison to the worms that were just fed with a normal diet. So these pigmented bacteria were contributing to protecting the worm against the effects of oxidative stress. We also um, tested the protection that they could confer against radiation. So we did this by growing the worm for 15 days in growth medium and every day uh, the worms were subjected to a period of ultraviolet radiation. And again, what we saw is that the worms that were fed with our pigmented bacteria displayed a much higher survival rate than the worms that were just um, feeded with a normal diet. So the most promising uh, strains from, from this um, experiment uh, we selected for further characterization with HPLC. So this is a technique that you can use to study the pigment composition in whichever sample that you're interested in. So what we saw is that we, from the three different strains we analyzed, there was a very high diversity in the pigment content. Um, so typically, um, one isolate didn't display uh, one majority carotenoid, but they in fact displayed a wide range of carotenoids in the same isolate. Um, and also, there were many carotenoids that we weren't able to identify because we're not specialists in bacterial carotenoids, so there is a lot of stuff that we're still um, hoping to figure out with these, with these bacteria. Um, so this leads to the work that I'm doing while I'm here in Boston. So my idea is to optimize the growth conditions um, of specific carotenoid producing bacteria in order to maximize the growth of the bacteria and the carotenoid production. So it has been described that depending on what conditions you grow the bacteria in, they produce more or less carotenoids. And this makes sense because at the end of the day, carotenoids are used as a defense mechanism against different stress factors. So for example, if you grow the, the bacteria in high doses of salt in the medium, it's been described that they tend to produce more carotenoids to protect themselves against this stress. So my idea is to combine many different stress factors and test them all together and with combinations of them to see which would be the best to produce carotenoids for, um, for example, for com commercialization in the future. So for this, the first step was to sample some solar panels and we got kindly the people from the Arnold Arboretum uh, granted us permission to sample the solar panels there. And I also want to thank Olga Mayoral, who helped me with the sampling and took these nice pictures. Um, so the first step was to sample the solar panels, and this was actually done just about 10 days ago. And these are the look of the plates, which have only been growing for just over a week. So they're still not completely, um, they haven't developed the pigments yet, but you can see some uh, yellow, orange, and even some tiny red colonies growing, but typically they take a while longer to actually um, produce the pigments and develop them. But you can, you can already get an idea that these plates in a few days are going to be full of colors. So from these plates, um, I'm going to select uh, maybe 40 or 50 different colonies. And these colonies will then be um, isolated, purified, and um, conserved for all the future experiments. And Basically, what I'm mostly interested in using from the laboratory where I'm doing my stay is the Evolver. So the Evolver is a really amazing platform that they have just recently developed and that they will soon publish, um, which basically it allows to grow many uh, cultures of bacteria at the same time and allowing you to play around with the growth conditions. Because typically, when we want to do these type of experiments in the lab, 
we have to use a lot of um, a lot of growth media, a lot of material. Um, if you want to test different temperatures, then you need uh, different um, incubators that will have those temperatures. So te typically, it requires a lot of time, a lot of material, and a lot of effort to do these type of um, experiments. But the good thing about Evolver is that each of the so in the top of the picture, you can see there is 16. Uh, different black vials, and each of these contain a 40 milliliters glass vial that is an independent culture. So the good thing about this is that you can grow up to 16 different types of cultures at the same time, and these are all connected to a fluidic model, module that allows to um, play around with the type of media that you're, you're inserting in the vials. So this can be used from uh, renewing the media every certain amount of time to take in samples to adding stress factors to the medium such as um, additional salt over time um, this is also coupled to a smart sleeve so each of these independent vials um, is surrounded by a smart sleeve that allows you to control up to three different parameters so you can control temperature you can control irradiation um, you could control anything you want really with this because these are like they're completely customizable and also these smart sleeves contain a device that measures optical density which is a parameter that we use in microbiology to see how well the bacteria are growing and all this is coupled to a very good software system that allows you to automatic to design all these experiments and run them automatically and automatically collect all the data so all in all this uh, device um, allows you to do high throughput experiments with many different culture conditions and in a very efficient way so going back to what I was saying before um, my goal while I'm here is to test out different combinations of stress factors and see how they influence carotenoid production so I just want to thank everyone for watching and especially the funding sources and the people that have made all this research possible. And if you'd like to ask any questions, um, please do. You're welcome to just ask any questions you're interested in in the comment section and I will be very happy to respond. Questions, suggestions, anything is welcome. So thank you.